Good morning, everybody. Come on, everybody, make your way in. We'll start with communion. Welcome. Merry Christmas. Well, on the night before Jesus was betrayed, he was meeting with his disciples. He brought out bread and wine. And as he took the bread, he says, take this in remembrance of me, of the body that was broke for you. He then took the wine out and he said, take, drink. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of the blood that was shed for you. Please partake. like to start with an opening prayer. Almighty God, as we celebrate the birth of the greatest gift of all, your Son, we thank you for being such a gracious and forgiving Lord. We thank you for always being with us during our daily journey, journey during the highs and the lows. We thank the Holy Spirit for being here today, renewing everyone here in the auditorium and online. We pray for those that are having a difficult time during the holiday season. Pour your blessings and comforting spirit over them during their tribulations. We are here to worship and praise your holy name. Remove any distractions. Uplift the discouraged. Strengthen the weak. And lo love those that feel unloved. Let this church and your people be an encouragement to friends, family, and this community. Your son brought us the victory. We are victorious. Bless the worship team today. Bless Joey and the message. Lord, help us spread the word of this story of our great and gracious Lord, our Savior. We welcome your presence in your house. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Well, good morning, BLC. Are you guys ready to worship our Lord this morning after coming off our busy, wonderful, chaotic weekend, celebrating his birth and moving into the new year? We have so many things to be thankful for, so many things to praise our God for so many things to worship him for. Yeah. Let's sing to the Lord. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. Cause he opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God he holds the victory. Yeah, there's joy, there's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. Won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We're gonna shout. We shout out your praise. Oh oh oh. Shout out your praise. Oh oh. God who heals, and we sing to the God who saves, we sing to the God who always makes a way, cause you hung up on that cross, then you rose up from that grave, my God still rolling stones away. Be quiet. 
sing it out. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We're going to shout out your praise. Because we were the beggars, and now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. And now we're running free, and we are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Sing it out, because we were the beggars, and now we're royalty. And we were the prisoners, and now we're running free, because we are, we are forgiven.
could not, death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the bones of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory. Before you are raised to life again. And you have no worship you this morning no matter what we're facing no matter how we're feeling oh we still have so many reasons to worship you you are our eternal hope of glory our light affliction won't last very long our present troubles are small but eternity with you will never end. And you will wipe every tear from our eyes. And there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death, no more sickness, no more disease. How we long for that day. My soul longs for you, Lord, in a dry and weary land. As the deer pants for water, so my soul longs for you. fill this room now. Those who've never felt the presence of God, Lord, may you fill them up right now with your goodness, with your love, with your joy, with your strength, with your renewal. Those who are tired this morning, God, we need a refreshment. Refresh us this morning, Lord.
as we praise God, change the atmosphere. Shift the atmosphere, God. Shift the atmosphere in our hearts. Change our hearts as we praise. May we fix our eyes on you. And not on our problems, not on our troubles, not on our trials, but on Jesus Christ, our King. to babe on bended knee, the Savior of humanity, and to us our child is born, he shall reign.
and you may be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. I got a few announcements for you. Welcome to all our guests here and everybody online. Special shout out to Belinda. I know where you're watching at home. Hopefully, uh, you're getting feeling better and be back here next week with us. Uh, we believe everyone here matters to God, and we pray today is an encouragement to each and every one of you. Um, small groups continuing in C2, how to read the Bible, stop on by. Uh, nursery is still open across the hall as well. Um, Operation Christmas Child, once again, thank you for your participation in that. We're able to ship out 48 boxes, and they were all delivered to the Philippines. Um, Philippines is located in Southeast Asia. Um, it consists of thousands, hundreds of islands and more than 22,000 miles of coastline. The Samaritan's Purse began um, distributing boxes to them in 1999 and then launched the Greatest Journey program in 2010. Uh, please continue to pray for both for the boy or the girl that received your box. Continue to lift them up. Um, pray that they, their heart becomes softened to the gospel of Jesus and also that their family and their community is transformed as God's love is um, shown through the simple little gift of that little box that you gave them over Christmas. Prayer night will continue in the advanced prophetic word January 16th at the Henry's house. Um, one more little announcement. As 2021 is closing, 22 is upon us. Um, we'd like to ask you to continue to pray for your leaders as we begin to look at next year's programs, how we're going to do things next year. Pray that the Holy Spirit comes over, over them. I'd like you to especially pray for my budget team. Uh, we really want to give a booster shot to our building program for next year. So any fundraising ideas you have, please feel free to share them with me. Um, we're open to anything. We really want to get that building program a big jump next year. A um, couple special announcements. Got a couple birthdays. Um, Aunt Jerry, who's usually with us, is not here. She's got a birthday this week. And a, I guess we have a Christmas baby in our crowd. Where's Fred? Fred had a birthday yesterday. All right. So I'd like to have the ushers come forward, please. Two ways to give here. Uh, at VLC, of course, we have the offering bucket. Make sure you pick up your envelopes up at the Connection Center. Um, also, we do online, www.vlcchurch.tv forward slash give. Also, any prayer requests, please continue to fill out those connection cards. Put those in the offering bucket. So I'd like to pray over the offering today. Oh, Lord, we thank you for the gracious gifts, blessings, and love that you show us every day of our lives none of which is greater than the gift of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Your steadfast love and mercy guides us and gives us the perseverance to prevail over life's daily challenges and hurdles. With this offering today, we give you back just a small portion of the blessings that you have provided to us. Amen. May this offering be used to your church's mission to bring more people to know you as their one and only Savior. Amen. Bless this offering. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, Merry Christmas. We call this the A-Team because the A-Team shows up, right? Amen. We, we miss everybody that it, that's out. I know several are, are sick. Belinda, we are praying for you, with you. The summer working. Some have family uh, things that they're doing. But uh, we appreciate those of you that after a long, sometimes tiring and exhausting holiday, you come and spend time with your church family because every time the church gathers together, Jesus is here, and he's worth seeing each and every week, right? Amen. We, we're so thankful for you. Um, I uh, had an amazing Christmas. I just you know, want to fill you in on some of my experience. This year, my oldest daughter, Jocelyn, decided she's going to help my coolness factor, and she got me a new outfit so that these are uh, threads from my oldest daughter. She even taught me how to wear the clothes. Um, the the, the overshirt remains unbuttoned and it stays down like this. And it was kind of funny backstage. She was even like straightening me up and everything. So uh, when we get the budget, Scott, we need to put in for a stylist. I think she she's going to bid for the job. So um, I also got these awesome socks. I saw at a store. It says, I love Jesus. <laughs> you know, you want some of these. If you don't love Jesus, what's the point, right? 
So so I, I love them. I'm rocking those today. Got some new shoes, and so I'm feeling all, all styling and profiling today. Uh, I hope that you are blessed and feel loved by your family as well. And uh, and I just am excited to get into the word. We want to finish this year off uh, just going through the story. We've been in this uh, journey, really, over four weeks, uh, called The Journey, looking at not just the Christmas story, but characters in the Christmas story, kind of looking at what was going on in their lives and maybe how Jesus impacted them and, and what we can kind of pull from their lives to gain some hope and some encouragement in, in our lives because we're all on a journey with Jesus too. Either you're going to meet Jesus one day or you've met him and now you are trying to follow him. And in either way, there can be questions, there can be circumstances and experiences, sometimes unknowns. And, and so we looked at Zechariah, we looked at Joseph, Mary, some unknown characters, Anna and Simeon. And today we're going to hit three other characters quickly and just kind of comment of maybe some takeaways we can pull from their part of the story that they played in the, the story of Christmas. And so the first group I want to look at today are the wise men. Somebody say the wise men. Right, the three wise men, we three kings of Orient are. You know, we we know who these guys are. We we see them all the time, every year. And but have you ever thought about this? My wife and I were talking about this, and she asked some really uh, insightful questions. Have you ever wondered why the wise men are in the story to begin with? Like out of nowhere, three guys from the east see a star, and they're like, "Oh, I guess we're going to go see Jesus today." Right. Uh, it's it's like what? How did they even know the star meant anything? Let alone to follow it to Bethlehem to find Christ to be involved. Like really, what's the point? And, and so um, it, these are questions that you have to ask because sometimes the stories of the Bible, if you don't, if you just gloss over them, it's kind of like okay, that was interesting, but what does that mean? Like well, what's the purpose? And so we're gonna kind of look at maybe where uh, these three guys come from. Um, it's kind of strange that they just randomly show up. So some background on the wise men. Scholars have really kind of found some clues that really connect us, I think, to maybe where they originated, where they came from. The, uh, the name wise men comes from another word in the, the Greek language. It's the word magi or magus. So th this is really what they are. They are the magi or the magus, they were the wise men. They were scholars in their own right in their day. They were deeply studied, well-educated. They were even in the higher court of whatever kingdom they were coming from, most likely Medo-Persia or Babylon. And, and so they're, they're coming from the east, traveling to uh, f find Jesus following this star. Now, we're going to take a little journey into the Old Testament. Do you remember in the Old Testament when Israel began to turn their backs on God, king after king after king began to sin against the Lord, leading the nation into wickedness. God was finally like, okay, I've had it. You all don't got to go home, but you can't stay here. You know, and he kicks them out of the land. Do you remember where they went? Where did they go? They went into Babylon. The, the king Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came in, conquered the territory, destroyed the city, and sent most of Israel into exile, sent them packing. During that time, God was warning the nation. He was raising up prophets to call the nation to repentance, saying, if you don't repent, if you don't turn your ways, this is going to happen. Of course, they didn't listen, and God is true to his word. They were conquered by the Babylonians, and they were sent into Babylon. And while they were doing that, King Nebuchadnezzar looked for the best and the brightest, the most attractive Israelites, had them trained in their schools, in their language, in their ways, because his thought was, if I take the best and the brightest of every conquered territory, we'll be unstoppable. And so he trained these Israelites that were smart, they were gifted, they were well-to-do, affluent, in the ways of Babylon so they could help their nation become unstoppable. And during that time, God raised up another prophet. His name was Daniel. You remember Daniel? Yeah, Daniel was famous from what? Daniel did what? What did they do, girls? Daniel's... Yes, the lions, right? Right? They're, they're at the, Daniel's famous for staying the night in the lion's den, right? The, these guys were jealous of him, and they wanted to turn him into kitty litter overnight. 
So, so Daniel's famous for this, but before Daniel got to the lion's den, that was years and years after he entered Babylon. The first couple of years he was there, the king has a dream. It's actually a vision, and it's a troubling dream. It bothered him so much that he went to all of his wise guys, his wise men, and said, you need to tell me the interpretation of this dream, but more so, you need to even tell me what this dream is. I'm not going to tell you what the dream is. You're going to tell me the dream, and then you're going to tell me the interpretation. That way I know what you're telling me is true. And all of the wise guys in the, in the land were like, nobody can tell you this but the gods. Nobody can do that. Well, as King Nebuchadnezzar did, he was really good at killing people. He said, I don't, you know, I'm not going to buy that. I'm not going to deal with that. So since you're all useless, you're going to die. So he sent out a decree to kill all the wise men in the land. And Daniel and his three friends that spent the night in an oven one afternoon um, later in uh, the, the Bible, if you remember that story, um, they were involved in this whole thing. They, they began to plead, and they asked for one more day. They're like, ask the king, give us one more day that we could pray to the Lord and see if God would be gracious to give us the answer. And that night, God not only gave Daniel the dream, but he also gave him the interpretation. And so Daniel went to the king, and he said, Good king, I'm going to tell you, there's nothing in me that is worth anything, but God spoke, and here's what God had to say. And Daniel gave Nebuchadnezzar the dream, and he gave him the interpretation. And Nebuchadnezzar was so blown away that in Daniel 2.48, it says, The king appointed Daniel to a high position, gave him many valuable gifts, he made Daniel ruler over the whole province of Babylon, as well as chief over all the who? All the wise men. So in this one moment, God elevated Daniel to rule the nation of Babylon next to the king and made him ruler over all the wise men. So the question you have to ask is then, who are these wise men? Like, wh wh like who, who are involved in this? Like, what is the significance of the wise men? And in Daniel chapter 2, verse 2, as, as he's, Nebuchadnezzar is calling all these guys together to give them this task of interpreting the dream, it lists who all is involved in the wise men. In Daniel 2, 2, it says he called his magicians, his enchanters, his sorcerers, and his astrologers. Now, by show of hands, how many of you at your nativity scene at home have a trio of Gandalfs or Harry Potters in your... Uh, in, in your nativity scene. Anybody? Like, like, but that's who they were. The wise men were not just really smart guys. They were occultists. They were spiritists. They were magicians. They were sorcerers. They were occult leaders from the land of Babylon or Persia from the east. And Daniel, a man of God, happened to rule over them. Think about this. Babylon is the archetype for the demonic kingdom in the Bible. The Tower of Babel, where God separated the languages, is the center place of a massive rebellion against God. Babylon, all through Scripture, is a metaphor for the kingdom of darkness. And so God, in this moment, as he is disciplining Israel, raises up a man of God to rule over the kingdom of darkness and educate these people, these wise men, in the prophetic word of God. Daniel is in charge of their instruction. He's in charge and command over their group. He is their leader. And you can imagine as Daniel is in this position that he trains these magicians, these magi, in the art of prophecy, discerning signs and times, learning the scriptures, the prophecies that have been revealed by God about the one who would come who would save the people from their sins. In Numbers 24, 17, the Bible prophesies about the Messiah. It says, I see him, but not here and now. I perceive him, but far in the distant future. A what? A star will rise from Jacob, and a scepter will emerge from Israel. It will crush the heads of Moab's people, cracking the skulls of the people of Sheth. So what did the wise men go following? They followed the star, and who did they look for? They looked for a, a king, the newborn king. So how did they know to look for a star and that a king was being heralded by the star? It's because they knew the prophecy 
of the Messiah. And Isaiah 7, 14 says, All right, then, then the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, a virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. How did they know to look for a baby boy being born? It's because they knew the prophetic word. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 says, For a child is born to us, a son is given. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called, say this with me, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. He shall be called. Micah 5, 2. Where, where did they go? Where did they follow the star? And in Micah 5, 2, it says, But you, oh, where? Oh, Bethlehem, Ephrata. You're only a small village among the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel, whose origins are from the distant past, will come from you on my behalf. Daniel taught these sages these prophecies, so not only would they know what to look for, but that they would be watching for the signs of the Messiah because he would not just be a light to the Jews. In Isaiah 9, 1 and 2, it says, Nevertheless, the time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled, but there will be a time in the future when the Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the roads that run between Jordan and the sea, will be filled with what? Filled with glory. Jesus' is coming was glorious. Amen? The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. There's no greater darkness than the land of Babylon. And what did those steeped in darkness see? They saw the star. And what did the star do? The star led them to the light and the hope of the world, King Jesus. The Messiah of the Jews would be light to all the world. So the very same prophecies that were prophesied in the Old Testament, these wise guys knew. They knew. So at the right time, when the star rose in Judah, over the land of Bethlehem, these sorcerers trained in the school of Daniel from Babylon in the east knew Something was happening in the earth, something that had never happened before. A new era has come. It was the dawning of a new day. And what did they do to prepare to come and meet the king? They prepared three gifts, and not just random gifts. They were specific gifts with prophetic significance, gold. Representing the king of kings. Frankincense. Representing the prayer offered by a priest who intercedes for his people. And myrrh. The anointing oil for a body that would be sacrificed for the sins of the people. They knew exactly who he was and what he would do. They came to Jesus as kings. And here's the amazing thing. They came to him as kings, but they left as servants because they humbled themselves in honor to the true king, pledging their allegiance to the new king. The second character in the story we want to look at today is John the Baptist. And I know he kind of shows up later, and he's all crazy and whacked out wearing animal hair and and eating locusts and, and, you know, being all this this wild and crazy guy uh, shouting in the wilderness. But what's interesting about John's life is what the angel told Zechariah when he appeared to him at the temple. Remember when we were talking about Zechariah? The angel shows up, freaks him out. In Luke chapter 1, 12 through 17, here's what the angel says to Zechariah. It says, Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But then the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife Elizabeth will give you a son. You're to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks, because he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of their fathers to the children, 
and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. John was not just another one random child being born. John had a huge purpose for his life. He had a significant purpose. And what I think is amazing here, we don't often think about this because we're living in the new covenant where anyone who believes receives the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But here it says, before even the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, John would be filled with the Spirit even before his birth. That the Spirit would come upon and fill John. There would be such a powerful anointing on John. And and it's my personal belief that when Mary goes to visit Zechariah and Elizabeth, and the moment she hears Mary's voice and John leaps for joy in in, uh, Elizabeth's womb, I believe that's the moment the Spirit came upon John. Because when the Spirit comes upon you, you have a reaction. There's no... When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you can't help it. Be filled with joy and gladness and peace in the presence of the Lord. John leaps for joy. And then his mother, being overwhelmed with what's happening with John, begins to prophesy. The gifts of the Spirit begin to manifest in them. It's an amazing moment. But John has a special calling on his life. The angel said he would be a fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, the prophet says, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So before the Messiah would come, that God was going to send Elijah. Elijah was one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. The people of God knew who Elijah was. They knew what Elijah did. He's the guy that called fire from heaven on the, on the sacrifice that had been doused seven times over in water against the prophets of Baal. It was a great victory for God, an amazing moment. So they knew who Elijah was, and God was going to send them Elijah. So think about what they're thinking that they're going to receive in this moment. That before the Messiah, Elijah is going to return. Now, we have no record that John the Baptist ever did any such miracles. That there wasn't anything miraculous about his life. But Jesus says something very significant about it in Matthew chapter 11. He says, John is the man whom the scriptures refer when they say, Look, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way before you. He is saying that John is the Elijah that is coming. And he says, I tell you the truth of all who have ever lived, that is a long list. But of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. You mean Moses? Moses was a pretty big deal. Noah was a pretty good boat builder. I mean, he was pretty good. Adam, aside from his affinity for bad fruit, he was pretty cool. Better than Adam? The first guy God said was all good? Yep, John was better than him. You see, John occupied an incredibly important role even before his birth. His ministry would prepare the nation and the world for the Messiah. And what's interesting about John, not just that he wore animal skins or ate locusts and honey, but many scholars even believe he belonged to a group that we don't often talk about, a group called the Essenes. When you read your New Testament, you often hear about the Pharisees. I don't want to be a Pharisee, you know. And then the Sadducees, they're really sad, you see, you know. Sorry, I'm going back to my old Sunday school ways. But there's a third group out there that was also called the Way. They were the Essenes. They lived out in the desert near Qumran. If you heard about the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were the ones who kept the library of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so they are a a strange group of people, but a lot of what John did and how he operated and lived his life mirror what life with the Essenes was like, their purity laws, their practice of baptism for purification and sanctification of the soul. But the mantra of the Essenes, what they believed they were, they believed they had a significant role in the world. They believed they were the voice crying out in the wilderness saying, prepare the way of the Lord. This is who they thought they were, that they would fulfill this prophetic calling uh, prophesied by the prophets of the Old Testament. And one day, John is ministering, he's preaching and teaching, and, and the people come and ask him, well, who are you? 
because of the significance of his ministry, they didn't know if he was the Messiah or he was somebody else. And so they wanted to know, are you the Messiah? Are you the one that we've been waiting for? Because your following's growing. You have this message. You're against all the religious morons that think that they're super cool. You're against Rome and all the wickedness of King Herod. Like, are you the Messiah? And here's what John says in John 1.23. John replied in the words of the prophet Isaiah, I am a voice shouting in the wilderness, clear the way for the Lord's coming. So what John's saying is like, I'm not the Messiah. I'm the one shouting in the wilderness. So we have this connection between the Essenes and John because they're both claiming the same fulfillment. There's strong connections that he was part of this Essene act. And, the, and what's interesting about that fact is that the, they believe that the Pharisees, when they adopted the Babylonian calendar, and the Sadducees, when they adopted a different calendar than the one God had given them, that they had apostatized from the true faith, and what was considered Judaism in the day of Christ was really a false faith. It was corrupt. So they were holding fast to the true faith in the desert, awaiting the Messiah, while everyone else was pleading for power, prominence, and position. So it's highly likely John trained and studied with this group. But John, he consistently stood against the religious leaders and the Pharisees, Sadducees of the day, even King Herod for sinful practices and, and came against, that's how he ultimately lost his life. But King Herod, Herod the Great, that is the uh, king at the time of the birth of Christ, he had an affinity for the uh, Essenes. And we're going to get into... Uh, Herod in just a minute. But I think John, the reason why John had such favor and he was away, able to get away with a lot of things is because he was connected to this group that had a pass from the Herods. And we're going to find out why. The third character that I want to look at today is King Herod, Herod the Great. Now, King Herod was not a king by birth. He was actually a poor young man. His parents were not affluent. He was not Jewish. He was I Idumean, or he was from the line of Esau, you know, Jacob and Esau. Jacob, his line carried on the, Jew, the Jewish people. Esau, his brother, uh, carried on um, a different group of people, and he was from the line of Esau. And so what happened when King Herod was a young boy, was recorded by um, historian Flavius Josephus, is that there one day as Herod was doing his thing, he was hanging out as a young child, an Essene, the Essenes were known for being accurate prophets of God. They, were, they, they have some incredible prophetic things that are just right on target that have been fulfilled through history, and even Flavius Josephus notes that people revered, uh, revered them as holy and divine prophets of God. And one day, one of the Essenes came by and saw Herod and prophesied that Herod would become king one day. And lo and behold, Herod did become king. And so he revered them as being prophets. And so when he took control of the nation, he was appointed by Rome to take control of the land, he locked the nation down, placed high taxes on the people because in his mind he thought he wasn't great unless he built every major uh, statue and palace and every possible thing he could build. And so he was constantly building things. He had this great hubris about himself. And so that's why they called Herod the Great because he was a great builder. But he gave the Essenes a pass. He didn't require them to follow any of the decrees or dictates that, that uh, he put on everyone else because he believed that there was something divinely appointed and special by the Essenes. And so uh, as John the Baptist was doing his ministry, I believe that's why he was able to do so many things uh, and not be uh, opposed by the Herods until later in his life. But King Herod, again, heavily focused on beautifying the nation. The story goes, and history reports that as he got older, he got more paranoid. He got crazier, began to think that uh, there was an enemy around every corner. Matter of fact, he had a couple wives and some of his own sons murdered because he thought they were going to try to take over his kingdom. So he was becoming extremely paranoid. But yet, he still had this, this mind to respect the prophetic word that had come before him. So you can imagine as he's trying to build his kingdom, he's trying to hold on to power, he's going to great lengths to do so, when three Harry Potters show up in his nation saying, we're following a star because there's a king being born who's going to rule over this nation. 
and he happens to be the present king, you can understand why that might rub him the wrong way. When he finds out they're in the nation, if you read the scripture, it says he goes to his scholars to have them search the scriptures to find out where the king would be born. How would he know to do that unless he already knew what the prophecies were? He was a student of prophecy. Though he wasn't a Jew and he didn't revere God, he did believe that what they said was true. So the Magi come in. He has this private meeting with the Magi, and he tells them, when you find this king, come back and report to me so I can worship him too. In a dream, the Magi are warned, don't go back to King Herod. He's up to no good. And so when after they see Jesus, they leave and they go a different way so that they don't get caught up with Herod. Herod was so angry that, they were, that he was fooled by the Magi. It says in Matthew 2, 16 through 18, Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A cry was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. This passage is why many scholars believe Jesus was somewhere around two years of age during this time because it says that he killed the babies two years old and younger based on when the Magi first saw the star appear. So there were multiple appearances of the star, and it took them time to get to Jesus, so it could be anywhere between one to two years of age. But if you think of what Herod did, that was a brutal move. Brutal. Devastating, one, to the people of Judea. But it was just harsh and wicked. But not long after this, around 4 B.C., Herod himself died. And what's recorded about Herod is the depth of his malady caused him incredible anguish. He had pain from the inside out. He had insatiable hunger, but no food satisfied his cravings. His organs were on fire constantly. He had infection in his body that attracted worms, swelling in his feet, difficulty breathing when sitting up, convulsions throughout his body that increased pains to an insufferable degree. And it was said by those who divine or the prophetic voices around him that God had inflicted this punishment on him for his lack of godliness, that he was an incredibly ungodly and wicked king. And though he himself hoped to recover, his condition, it is recorded, was beyond what anyone could seem to bear. This man who was great in his own eyes, even had the title Herod the Great, couldn't hold on to what he was desperately trying to hold on to. He died not long after the birth of Christ, not long after, maybe within a couple years, of massacring the innocent. So here we have three stories, the Magi, John, and Herod, all of which are involved in the story of Christ. I just want to give you a few takeaways briefly from each of them that I think can encourage us, can give us hope, and maybe cause us to think about some things a little differently than maybe when we walked in this morning. Number one, what I see in the Magi is that hope in Jesus is not a fool's hope. Hope in Jesus is not a fool's hope. 2 Corinthians 6.2 says, For God says, and this is a word for someone today, At the right time I heard you. On the day of salvation I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is a day of salvation. God is not a right now on a whim kind of God. God is not fickle. He doesn't just nonchalantly make decisions. God is a right time kind of God. Think about the Magi. These men were holding on to promises of God for hundreds of years. They weren't the first to receive them. They were generations down the line. There are promises we've been given by God that might not be for us, but it might be for our great-great-grandchildren. There are promises we've been received from God that might not be for the immediate and the here and now, 
but it might be from some time from now. That there's going to be a time to wait, a time to cling, a time to persevere. There are promises we've been given that might take some time to be fulfilled. But our hope in Christ is not a fool's hope. Why? Because God's word never fails. He always keeps his promises. Jesus is risen from the dead. Our perseverance, our not giving up when it feels hopeless or or pointless, will pull us closer to the fulfillment of God's promises rather than pull us away. Think about if the Magi quit looking for the star year after year after year after year. If they stopped studying the scriptures because they just didn't see how it applied to their lives. If they quit passing the teachings on to the next generation, they would have missed it when it came. They would have missed their moment to encounter Jesus, who flipped their lives upside down. From being kings to servants. From being rich in the eyes of men to being extremely rich in the eyes of God. Jesus said the least among us will be the greatest in the kingdom. And they discovered with Jesus that worldly honor is nothing compared to being honored by the creator of the universe. And see, from that point on, they had a new relationship with God. It tells us that they were following a star to find God. But after they met him, he was speaking to them in dreams and visions. They went from following star charts to hearing his voice. All the knowledge in the world doesn't pale in comparison to knowing and following Jesus. And they discovered these wise men. I love this. They discovered the truth of Proverbs. It says, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord, the reverence of God, the honor of God. See, sometimes God has to take you out of a dark place before the light of his promises can be seen. You can't see in the dark. So what's he do? He moves you out so you can see. The Magi were drawn out of Babylon, out of Persia, places of darkness into Israel where the light could be seen, where God's presence was. Before you can see the fulfillment of God's promise in your life, it may mean a change of scenery, a new environment, something new, a new place, something foreign to you now, but it will be something that will open you up to new possibilities. So, beloved, what promises has God given you you may have given up on? What place are you in spiritually right now that maybe you need a change of position so you can go from darkness to light? And are you ready to follow him wherever he leads? What I see in John is that the world will try to put labels on you and define you, but only God can define who you are. And only God can determine what you are meant to do. You see, John, he was a son of Zechariah, who was a priest of God, who was supposed to serve in the temple when it was his time and when it was his duty. But where was John? He was out in the desert preaching, not wearing priestly garments. He was wearing animal skins. See, the world has an expectation on you, what you should look like, what you should do, what you should think, what you should enjoy, what should entertain you, what you should think is funny. But, beloved, God has a different idea. And though John's birth was miraculous, he had this great call on his life. He was filled with the Spirit even before he was born. John's job was not to be Jesus. It was to prepare the way for Jesus. See, sometimes before God can do what he wants to do in our lives, we have to get out of his way. See, preparing the way means cultivating the ground for God to work. It's like a farmer trying to plant a field. You have to till the soil before the seeds can grow. And we're called to till the ground so the farmer can plant the seeds. 
And we try to be the savior of our own lives. We try to control our circumstances. We try to control other people that are struggling. We see a need and we try to swoop in and be like, man, I can help that person. I can, I can rescue that man if they would just follow my advice or, man, if they'd get their act together, if they'd stop doing this. Beloved, you can't fix your spouse. You can't fix your boss. You can't fix your friends. You can't fix your kids. You can't fix anyone. Why? Because you can't even fix yourself. But when we try to do God's job, we're just in his way. That's good. We all need that. You can't fix the people in your life that need to be fixed, but you can prepare the way for Jesus to do the fixing. You can fast and you can pray. You can yield your heart more and more to God. You can release the things you're trying to control and give God more authority in your life to work. You see, John, one of the most powerful things John ever said is they were looking to him and his disciples were jealous because Jesus' following was growing. They were becoming more prominent. People were leaving John's group to go over to Jesus because he was the Messiah. But they were looking at John and be like, man, John, you've been around a lot longer. You've been doing this more. You know, what are you going to do about all those people following Jesus? And John said in John 30, 30, he must become greater and greater and I must become less and less. The more we try to become greater and greater, God becomes less and less. But if we choose to be less and less and let God be who he is, who is great, we're going to see greater things. The more we make our mission, our circumstances about us, what we want, we're going to slow down or prevent God's will from being revealed. And his will is better for us than anything we could want for ourselves. Do you think John wanted to be put in jail and beheaded? Anybody want to go for that one? No. But he knew something. He knew that if he didn't get out of the way, Jesus couldn't do what Jesus came to do. And he laid himself down so Jesus could fulfill his purpose, which was laying himself down. Beloved, you are called for a great purpose. God said in Ephesians 2.10, he has work for you to do that he's planned before the foundation of the world. And it's the Holy Spirit in you that unlocks the potential God has put in you. You have been called, but you're not called to be the Savior, your own Savior, or somebody else's Savior. But you are called to prepare the way for the Savior. So what has God called you to do for this moment? What can you do right now to cultivate the ground, to prepare your life, your situation for God to move? In what ways have you been ab- maybe been getting in God's way trying to be the Savior rather than letting Jesus be the Savior? Finally, number three, what I see in Herod. What I see in Herod is one big, oh, missed opportunity. Think about it. God gave him his promotions. God said, I'm choosing you. I'm appointing you. You're going to be king. God appointed Herod to power. But Herod used his promotion for his own popularity. Beloved, the platform God gives us is not for our glory, it's for his. Wherever you are, wherever you find your feet, Whatever your audience is, whatever your job, your platform is not for you. It's for him. Herod was threatened because he thought Jesus was going to take away his promotion. He thought he was going to ruin his dreams of having this great kingdom and be this great king. So instead of worshiping Jesus, Herod warred against Jesus. How many of us feel like that when we know God's calling us to do things? We feel like God is going to take something away that we really enjoy rather than bless us with something greater and better. God is in the business of greater and better. Every good gift flows from the Father of lights. There is no repentance in the giftings and callings of God. 
he doesn't take back what he's bestowed upon us. He's not like that. And we wrestle with that sometimes. God, if I, if I surrender this part of my life, I feel like you're never going to let me do it again. I'm never going to get to do that. <laughs> well, God, if, if, if I break up with that person, then I, I know they're not right for me, but if I break up, then I'm probably never going to meet anybody else again, and, and no one's going to love me, and, and, and I'm going to be alone, and I'm going <laughs> to... We battle all this stuff. Herod tried to hang on to his blessings. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 25, if you try to hang on to your life, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for my sakes, you're going to save it. You're going to find it. You're going to find true life. See, beloved, God isn't in the business of taking blessings away. He knows the plans he has for you, says the Lord. They're for good and not disaster, to give you a future and a hope. He's in the business of ridding us of pride so that through humility he can lift us up in honor. See, pride tries to take God's glory, the glory that doesn't belong to us, and claim it for ourselves. And that's ultimately what the devil did. He said, God, your glory, I, I want that for me. I'm going to make myself more glorious than you. And that's how Satan fell. And we wrestle with that same pull in our hearts trying to take the glory that belongs to God for ourselves. But beloved, God loves to share his glory. Do you know that? God loves to share his glory. Let us make man in our own image, in our likeness. God loves to share, and he loves to share his glory. In eternity, we are joint heirs with Jesus all things planned to be given to Christ are given to also the sons and daughters of the Most High God. You can't fathom the blessing. You can't grasp the glory that's coming to the church of Jesus Christ. God loves to share His glory. And He freely shares it with us if we give Him what He desires, and that's our heart. And if we give him freely what belongs to him, and that's all the glory. But it's when we try to take what's his that we end up on the wrong side of the struggle. Imagine for a moment the blessings on Herod's kingdom if he had worshipped Jesus. If he had bowed to the knee. If he had surrendered to Christ in that moment. Maybe he wouldn't have been sick, or maybe he, wouldn't, maybe he would have gotten healed. See, if you try to kill the doctor who's trying to heal you, you're choosing to live with the illness. Herod forgot it was God who promoted him because he was too busy fighting with him to encounter God's goodness in Christ in a way that could change his life and his whole family for generations. And so what happened? He ended up losing what he was desperately trying to hold on to anyway, and he died without ever knowing Jesus. And isn't that the case? When we try to hold on to things and control things and we get so worked up over stuff, we end up doing the very thing we're fearing. We end up losing the very thing we're trying to hold on to. Jesus is right. If you try to cling it, cling to it, you're going to lose it. So, beloved, what opportunity might you be missing out on because you're fighting God's will rather than submitting to it? What blessings might you be missing out on in your life because rather than submitting to and surrendering to God out of fear of losing what's precious to you, you're trying to hold on to and control and manage your circumstances. You see, beloved, the toughest part of holding on to the promises of God, I really, I really believe this, the toughest part of holding on to God's promises is not quitting or giving up before they come to pass. God speaks something to your heart, and you know that God said it. The hardest part is holding on and waiting. It's the hardest part. The toughest part about working and partnering with God is not getting in his way and trying to do his job for him. Out of being impatient or anxious. It's just like Abraham and Sarah. God says, I'm going to give you a son, and it's going to be with your wife. Yes, her 
womb is like dust, and it's going to be near impossible in your eyes, but I'm going to do it. It's going to be a miracle. Well, they didn't, he didn't do it fast enough, so what did they do? They decided to take matters into their own hands, and they made a mess of life that's reverberated for nations, for generations. When we get anxious and impatient and we try to take things into our own hands, we don't wait on the Lord. So when things get messed up, the toughest part of working with God is not getting in His way and trying to do His job for Him. The toughest part of surrender is giving God glory, recognizing your promotion wasn't your doing to begin with. You know, we all like being complimented and encouraged. And, and, you know, it's really hard, especially in my position, you preach a message and you have several people come up and you're like, man, that was fire. Or that was awesome. That was a good word, Pastor. Sometimes you're like, yeah, that was a good word, wasn't it? You know, you're welcome. You know, <laughs> you know it's hard to look back and be like, if there was anything good, that was God doing it. It wasn't me. I know what I'm like. I know what I'm capable of. It's hard not to take that glory. When you're good at your job and you're being blessed financially, it's hard not to say, look how great I am at this. If you're great at sports and you're a lot of favor in athletics, it's hard not to say, man, look how good I am on the field. The toughest part of surrender is giving God the glory, recognizing your promotion wasn't your doing to begin with because every good thing comes from God. When we try to manage our lives, we often end up losing what we try so hard to control. So, beloved, no matter who you are, what you've done, what you're going through today, if you hold on to hope, if you trust in the promises of God and don't quit, don't give up, don't stop believing, but stop trying to be your own functional Savior. Stop trying to be everyone else's Savior. You can't do it. Don't stop believing. Don't stop trusting. But stop trying to be the Savior, but make the way for the Savior. And you'll see the fulfillment of God's promises. You'll experience His power in your life. And in time, you'll discover the purpose for everything you're going through. And that's where joy is found when God's promises are fulfilled. Again, the Lord doesn't want to take anything from you. But He does want to give you to give something up. And that's control of your own life. And trust in Him. And one of the greatest missed opportunities I think we have in Christianity, in the church, is really letting what we know up here travel down here. There, there are a lot of people who grow up in church, have heard the stories, heard the message. We've celebrated Christmas how many times? We've been to how many Christmas services or masses or whatever your background is and You've gotten dressed up. I remember as kids getting dressed up and going to these special things that bored me out of my mind, and I couldn't wait for them to be over and, and then, you know, get to what I really wanted to do, which was eat sweets and open presents, you know. And we just go through the routine of stuff, and we don't let really what we're getting up here come down here. There's many people who are in church even today who have grown up in church their whole life, and they've heard about salvation about beginning a relationship with God, and, and they think it just involves coming to church and being a part of the church, not truly making a personal decision to trust in Jesus, letting what's up here come down here. There are many believers who want to walk in the greater things of God, to be filled with the Spirit, walk in the gifts of the Spirit, to lay hands on people who are sick and see them healed, to prophesy, to hear God's voice. And we want that, but we don't want to take the opportunity to let what's up here come down here. Beloved, God is setting us up for a moment right now in this church and in the church for what's coming next year. And if you don't want to miss the opportunity to be a part of what God's doing, it's got to go from here to down here. It's got to. It begins with a true and authentic personal relationship with Jesus where you don't fight him anymore like Herod, but like the Magi, you bow down and you say, I'm yours. 
got to be, if you're going to serve Christ, it's got to be like John, where you say, you know what, it's not about me anymore. What I want, where I want to go, what I want to do, what I think is cool and flashy, it's just submitting and serving wherever God wants me, right here, right now. Whatever you want, Lord, you increase, let me decrease. And it's spending that time alone with the Lord so that when we gather together, we bring what happens at home in the gathering with us. That this place gets filled. It's no secret, I say this a lot, that I go to the gym several times a week and started going at night. And uh, there are a couple of Asian guys there um, that look familiar. And, you know, it's always weird when you're working out and people are looking at you funny. And you're wondering if, if your form's bad or, or what's going on, you know. So there's some, there's some strange birds that go to the gym. I'm just going to say, you know, they don't know how to use the equipment or they think they're, they're all bad and they really just look like an idiot. But um, so whenever people are kind of looking at you weird, you, you get kind of nervous. And so I started making conversation with them and I try to use those opportunities to talk about Jesus. So I'm asking God, okay, God, are you setting something up? Or, you know, what do you want to say? What do you want to do right here in and and I wasn't really getting anything, but I was just waiting for it because usually you, you stay at it long enough, you know, manifest. And, and so I'm talking with them, and, and the guy asked me, he was like, do you look familiar? And I was like, yeah, you look familiar too. And I'm thinking maybe maybe here it comes. And, and I, I said, where do you work? And he's like, Meyer. I was like, oh, I'm in Meyer all the time. Come to find out he's one of the sushi guys, you know, and uh, his partner is, is with him. So I get to talking with them, and they're from Burma. So they're Burmese. And, uh, and so I'm talking about their, their language, so it, I know they're from another nation, so I'm instantly thinking they're probably Buddhist or some type of spiritual background, and so I'm like, we're going to get to Christ, and either way, this is going to be a great conversation. So I start uh, talking with them, and I, I can't remember wh- what comes up, oh, they asked me what I was doing, wh- what I do, and I said I was a pastor, and, and so that led right into, um, you know, their faith, and like, oh, well, we're Christian, we're Christian. It's like, oh, you're Christian, that's cool, and so... I was like, well, when did you first begin to, you know, believe in Jesus, to have a relationship with Jesus? And, and the, the main guy that I was talking to, he, uh, he said it was about 2017. And he said, it's when I stopped letting what was up here stay up here. And what was up here came down here. And, and his friend was saying the same kind of story. And then I began to find out about their village. And that in their nation, in their village, it's surrounded by Buddhists. Spiritist. He said, my grandparents, they were spiritual. They worshiped their ancestors. They did animal sacrifices all the time because they were afraid of the spirits in the spiritual world. Because if you don't know this, in other countries, it's real deal. They're in charge. Where the light doesn't shine, the darkness is even darker. But God sent some missionaries that told them about Jesus. And before long, their entire village came to Christ. And what he said to me was so significant. He said, and all that fear of the spirits went away. When Jesus moved in, the darkness moved out. And beloved, God wants to do that everywhere on the planet. He wants to do it in Clio. He wants to do it in Michigan. He wants to do it from sea to shining sea in every nation, every town. But it's not going to happen until what's up here moves down here. And we stop talking about it and we start living it because it's who we are. We can sing about the star or we can let his light shine. We can serve Jesus, or we can get out of his way and let God do miraculous things through us. Or we can keep doing the same thing that we always do and miss every opportunity. I believe God has great things in store for 2022. But we have to decide what we're going to do about it. Let's bow for prayer. Father, I thank you for these stories, and I thank you, Holy Spirit, that it can be the same story. It can be the same cast of characters. 
But God, you have something to tell us through it each and every time we open the word. And so I pray right now that your word would sink deep into our hearts. That it would not just be head knowledge, a bunch of information we ingested over 45 minutes. But God, it would begin to trickle down as deep truth in our hearts. And Holy Spirit, I ask you right now to begin watering the seed, germinating in the soil. That fire would begin to light our hearts. God, I'm reminded every day of how weak I am, how imperfect I am, how incapable I am. Even getting ready to sing songs and teach a message, I'm reminded of how deeply unqualified I am to stand before you. And that's why, God, I want to get out of your way. And I want you to show off. And I will do what you want me to do. Say what you want me to say. Go where you want me to go. And I pray that the same heart over our body today, God. That if you want someone to get up and go speak an encouraging word over someone else, to pray over someone else, God, if there are people who are hurting here that needs, need prayer, God, that you would give feet to their faith and even in the act of coming forward that the miracle they need would begin to happen, that breakthrough would begin to happen because we're not going to fight it anymore. We're not going to fight and wrestle with these feelings in our heart that keep us in our seats or that keep us quiet or keep us afraid, God. We're, we're going to get out of your way. We're not going to miss an opportunity anymore. God, in 2022, we want revival to happen and we want it to begin with us in this church we want it to begin in this city. We want your spirit to be poured out. God, we want your power to be released so that people who are lost in darkness can see the light that they need through our lives. God, if there's someone here today that does not know you personally, maybe they believe in God. They believe the word is true. They've been in church for a long time. But there's never been a real, living, personal relationship with Jesus. Maybe they're hearing this for the first time. And they want to know how they can have a relationship with God. That they can find hope in Jesus today. God, I pray, that even though we, we do this time and time again. God, I pray that today, as we pray together. That your spirit would so wrap them up in your arms of love. That you would help them experience what John the Baptist experienced the first time he heard Mary's voice. And he leaped for joy in his mother's belly. God, that that joy would spring to life. And they would instantly know they're different. Because we are a new creation when we're in Christ Jesus. God, I pray as they pray. No matter how many times they pray to sinner's prayer in church. God, that today it would be a new day for them. That all religion would be broken off. All guilt and shame would be broken off. All the stuff that has been put on them. Every label, every definition, every thing, false belief they believed about themselves. God, that it would be a new day. And God, you'd break that hardness. And you'd give them a heart of flesh. As you break off all the stony edges. If you're here today and you want a true in living relationship with God. All he wants you to do is ask. And how we ask is in prayer. If that's you here today, just pray this with me. With all that you know how to do. From your heart to the Lord. Say, Father. As best as I know how. I want to give you my heart and life. I'm making the choice today. To let what's in my head come into my heart. Lord Jesus, you are my king. I will bow my knee to no other. I give you my life. I trust in your sacrifice and your forgiveness. Forgive me of all my sins, my mistakes. 
and fill me with your spirit. Give me the power to live for you, for your honor and your glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. With every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. We're going to enter a time of prayer. I'm going to invite our prayer team to come forward, those of you that are here. If there is a burden on your heart, Jesus cares. Just step out of your seat and come forward. We want to pray with you. We believe in the power of healing. If you have a health issue, I don't care how many times you've been forward to pray over it, come forward. We'll keep praying until the promise comes. If you receive Jesus as your Savior today and you're in the room, come. We want to rejoice. We want to pray with you and rejoice with you and ask God's blessing on your life. If you're hanging in discouragement and you need a word of encouragement, come. And we'll pray and ask the Lord, what is he saying over you? And we'll pray with you today. Whatever your need is for the next few moments, we want to put feet to faith. And so whatever it is, you come in Jesus' name. Beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Well, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Didn't want heaven without us. So, Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. So, what could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. Wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is, oh, nothing compared to this. 
What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the boast of sin and grace. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again, and you Lord, your name is powerful. Your name brings hope, and you are the light of the world. So, God, I pray for a fresh wind, a renewal in our spirit. God, I pray just for a revived heart, a revived church. God, that the discouragement of 2021 would fade, and this anticipation and excitement for what you're going to do in 2022, God, would begin to flood our hearts and minds. God, I pray for struggles in marriages and families and in workplaces, God, and in immediate family and distant family, God, and just all the many things coming against us. God, I pray that our hope in Christ would fill us and guard our hearts with the peace that passes all understanding. So, God, we just submit ourselves again to you. God, give us eyes to see the opportunities before us. Give us the strength and courage to our faith. And God, may you work in powerful ways as we see the kingdom of God come and your will done on this earth as it is in heaven. God, help us advance the kingdom with haste, with urgency, but also with love and joy that comes from the Holy Spirit. God, bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you, and may he give you his peace. Happy New Year.